Well, I keep Matthew 16 open if you would. We'll pray in just a moment. Um, gents, if I can just underline men for Christ again. It is for uh, every kind of age of man uh, at Christ Church. And it's also for those who may feel very new, as well as those who've been here for a very long time. So please don't feel, uh, whatever the title sounds to you, that it's not for you. If you're a man and you're a Christian person, then please come. I hope it'll be a, a great evening. Um, let's, um, let's pray and ask God to help us to have his mind as we've just sung. Father, thank you again for uh, your words that we have your way of living and the way of knowing you given to us. Uh, we pray that this morning you would make us ready to hear your voice uh, make us ready to think how you think and to follow the Lord Jesus in thought and word and deed. We ask it in his name. Amen. Chris Gillibo is typical of the independent spirit of our day. Chris Gillibo is a, an author and an explorer. He went to every country in the world, about 193, he reckons, before the age of 35. He prefers to work a 24-hour day for himself than one hour of the day for anyone else. Uh, the first point of his philosophy of life is you don't have to live your life the way other people expect. His first book was called The Art of Nonconformity. And his blog includes a list of things they have no right to tell you. An epitome of the independent spirit of our age. And in this day and age, a lot of that sounds very appealing. Uh, we react, don't we, against the institutions, against the organizations, against the establishment, telling us what to do with our lives, wielding their authority over us. No one has the right to tell me how to live. No one. Now, now, if you're thinking, I, guess I can see where the preacher's going with this, what he's going to do in a moment is say, but not us, not us Christians. And if you thought that, you're right. Gold star, top of the class. We have uh, one who does have authority over us to tell us how to live our lives, the Lord Jesus Christ. A Christian agrees to Jesus having the right to tell us how to live. And of course, as Christians, we're not independent spirits. Or are we? This morning, the question is, how does Jesus exercise that right to tell us how to live? And I think our verses are something of a surprise. If you're first with us this morning for the first time, we're in a series looking at the church and this morning we're going to look at one of the occasions out of two when Jesus talks about the church. He mentions the word just twice, once in Matthew chapter 18. We'll come to that in a few weeks' time. And the other time this morning, at Matthew chapter 16 in the passage today. If you look at verse 18, that's where he talks about the church. He says, I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. There are verses about how Jesus starts and builds the church and how Jesus expects the church to work, to function as the church. Let's look at the verses and let's see how we fare by the end. Uh, Jesus starts the church, he begins it with God's revelation of the truth. That's how the church begins. Jesus starts the church with God's revelation of the truth about Jesus. So Christians getting together, that wasn't the harebrained scheme of some early believers who loved meetings and committees. No, church was Jesus' idea. He starts the church, and he did it because it was time for a change. Jesus is picking up a very big story, and he's taking it in a new direction. You see, once upon a time, God's people had a very special job to do. They were to represent God on earth. So the world around could look on and know what God was like. 
So if the world wondered, is God a kind God or an unkind God? Is God a just God or an unjust God? And they could tell the answer by looking at God's people. The problem is God's people failed dismally in that job. They wanted to be more like their neighbors than like their God. But then Jesus comes along and he does the same job except he represents God to the world perfectly. The world can look at Jesus and know exactly what God is like. And as the king, Jesus will call a people to be citizens in his kingdom. And they would represent God to the world like he did. Matthew chapter 16 marks the start of Jesus gathering those citizens of that kingdom. And Jesus begins with the first person to see who Jesus is. Let's just have a look at the verses again. Um, Jesus is asking his disciples some questions. He asks them, who is it that people out there say that he is? Verse 14, they reply, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And then he asks them what they think. Verse 15, but what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? And speaking for the others, Simon Peter jumps up and verse 16, he says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus, I see it now. You are the supreme sovereign ruler over the whole world. You're the the king from God. There's no one in the world above you. You are where the buck stops in everything. Christian is someone who simply recognizes that. If you're new to the Christian faith, that is the question you must answer. Who do you think that Jesus is? And Jesus, when he hears Simon say that, he says, yes, God's pleased with that answer. He says, blessed are you. Blessed are you, he says, Simon, son of Jonah. But not because that was a tricky question and you did really well to work it out. Verse 17, because this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. God reveals the truth about Jesus first. That's how Peter knows it. And it's then that Jesus starts to talk about building his church. I was in a meeting this week, and uh, one of the uh, points on the discussion uh, was quite difficult, and someone remarked that, well, this is a bit like chicken and egg, isn't it? You know those things when it's difficult to work out what order they came in? which comes first. There are those who say that the existence of the church and the existence of the gospel are a bit like chicken and egg. If you go all the way back, how do you work out which one came first? Did the gospel produce the church? Or was it that the church worked out the gospel and then went around preaching it? It's a bit chicken and egg. Jesus says it's not chicken and egg at all. It's very clear. The church can only start because God first reveals the gospel, who Jesus is. The gospel comes first. God shows Peter Jesus is the Christ. Once that's happened, Jesus can start talking about the church. And he doesn't just start it. Jesus is the one who builds it. Uh, Christ Church Westbourne here has been around for all the decades it's been around only because Jesus has been at work in people down the generations. Let's just look on to verse 18. And I tell you that you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church. If you go to St. Peter's Church in Rome, Uh, You can see those words carved in stone in Latin around the marble dome of the building. And the traditional teaching of the Roman Catholic Church, as you may know, is that when Jesus here talks about the rock, he's meaning the man Peter himself. As the Second Vatican Council puts it, the Roman pontiff, that's the Pope, as the successor of Peter, is the perpetual and visible source and foundation of the unity of the bishops and the many faithful. In other words, all the popes are special because they're linked back down the line to Peter. 
Now, as you read more of the New Testament and how Peter gets on with things, it's hard to see why he should be elevated quite so highly. In a few verses' time, Jesus is going to rebuke him. In the book of Galatians, Paul rebukes him. And in the book of Acts, the church in Jerusalem holds him accountable. The, the, the rock is Peter, but not because of who he is. It's because of what he's just said. Jesus will build his church on Peter as he sees who Jesus is. In other words, verse 18 is linked to verse 16. If it was Peter himself who was the rock, Jesus may simply have said, and on you I will build my church. But that's not the case. What makes the rock is not the strength of the one who's saying this confession, but the truth of what he said, that Jesus is the Christ. And actually you see that in the book of Acts. Peter was very significant for the beginning of the church. In Acts 2, he proclaims the gospel to the Jews. In Acts chapter 8, he proclaims it to the Samaritans. In chapter 10, he proclaims it to the Gentiles. He was very significant, but only in so far as he kept to the truth about Jesus. And so when Peter himself, he begins to write a letter, which is in the New Testament, he describes the building of the church, and he says, it happens as you come to him, meaning Jesus. He doesn't say, as you come to me. He says, as you come to him, to Jesus. And because Jesus is the one building it, verse 18, the gates of Hades will not prevail, will not overcome it. As we've prayed this morning, the... Uh, violent persecution of Christians by ISIS has been very horrifying to hear. Twice this week I've heard of terrifying stories of families facing beheading uh, unless they deny their faith in Christ. And as you put extraordinary stories like that up against Jesus' words here, the gates of death will not defeat Jesus building his church. Whatever that happens to be, he will build his church. We need to hear it in our own nation, do we not? Uh, the attendance figures for the Church of England churches over the last century have gone from 3.5 million to just below 1 million. The decline in attendance across all denominations has only recently slowed down. Jesus promises that he will build his church of those who trust him. He won't do it if churches lose confidence in proclaiming what Peter saw, that Jesus is the Christ. He will do it as local gatherings continue with Peter's confession. Jesus is the Christ. The church where um, Alistair Payne is now vicar, uh, the vicar before I was vicar here, at uh, St. Andrew the Great Ch Church in Cambridge, it has a little book of its history. And that book describes the work of one of the previous vicars, a man called Mark Ruston. It says this, Mark Ruston preached faithfully about Jesus for three decades. And that word did the work of building up a congregation. To the point where it could no longer fit the building. The history of that congregation is not a story of strategies, plans and visions for future development the regular teaching of the Bible has shaped the strategy. The preached word has led the church forward. Let me ask you, do you want Jesus to grow the church that is Christ Church Westbourne? Do you want Christ Church Westbourne to move forward and to develop? If you do, you pray that there will be continuous and bold and clear proclaiming of the truth that Jesus is the Christ. From up here, in every small group, in every children's group, in every Christianity Explore group, and in every one-to-one -one casual conversation over coffee. That is how Jesus will build his church. And then Jesus explains how he expects the church to work or to function. And he gives the church authority in line with the truth about Jesus. There's a, a school in the Midlands called St. Peter's College and it has as its emblem two very chunky keys crossed over like that. 
And the Apostle Peter is often associated, isn't he, with the power of the keys, which sounds a bit like a sort of fantasy film to my mind. And we have those jokes, don't we, about Peter at the pearly gates, who's he going to let in, the Englishman, the Irishman, or the Scotsman, or whoever it is. The keys, verse 19, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. They are a, a sign of authority. They symbolize the control of a doorway, the authority to open, the authority to close, to let in and to keep out. So this authority that Jesus is giving is first of all to affirm those who are in the kingdom. Peter has authority from Jesus to declare who is one of his, who's in the kingdom of heaven and who isn't. Not because Peter is somehow super special, but it's because Peter is seeing that Jesus is the Christ. And again, you see it in the book of Acts. He opens the kingdom to Jews, to Samaritans, to Gentiles. And if you like, he closes the kingdom because he judges Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 5. He judges Simon the sorcerer, as he's called, in Acts chapter 8. But one writer, I think this is helpful, has likened the local church in this way to an embassy. You've ever been to an embassy uh, recently or at all um, where... There is a, a building, a body, representing one country inside another country with the purpose of protecting, looking after its citizens. So imagine you, know, imagine you go to Spain for three months or something like that, and during that time your passport runs out, and you no longer have the, the, document, the documentation you need to, to affirm that you are a UK citizen, and so you go to the embassy to get your passport renewed. When the embassy does that, the embassy is not making you a UK citizen, it's affirming that you are. On your own, you don't have the authority, do you, to declare that you are a UK citizen. No, the embassy is there to do that. It represents your country in Spain. The local church, if you like, represents the kingdom of heaven in the foreign land that is on the earth. And the church affirms the citizens of that kingdom protects them, looks after them. In terms of last week in Ephesians, the local gathering represents the heavenly gathering. But this is, I wonder, where our eyebrows may raise further because Jesus gives Peter the authority too to assess kingdom behavior. Verse 19. I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Peter will have the, the say-so on how citizens of the heaven are not to live, whatever Peter binds, and given the say-so on how citizens of the kingdom are free to live, whatever Peter loses. And again, you see that in the book of Acts, where the, Peter's teaching about circumcision or the, the food laws. And Peter's authority, in line with the truth about Jesus, is an expression of the authority of heaven. Now, before we think, hang on a second, isn't that a bit Pope-like? This authority seems to spread to the disciples as well, because in Matthew chapter 18, we'll see it. The same phrase comes, whatever you bind on earth, whatever you bind in heaven. And Jesus there is talking to the disciples. Jesus is expecting that together, under the truth of Jesus, they have the right to assess a believer's behavior, to ask how are these kingdom citizens living. And that's why there's such a thing as church discipline. Maybe you didn't know there was such a thing as church discipline. But in a continuing way today, the local church has been given authority to both affirm kingdom people and to assess kingdom behavior. So you read the New Testament letters in the local church, and Christians are commanded to love one another, yes, to forgive one another, yes, but also to teach one another, to admonish one another. There's this sense in which the church, under the truth about Jesus, have responsibility for one another's lives. You are all partly responsible for my Christian life. We are all partly responsible for your Christian life. I don't know if that's a very new way of thinking to some of us, but it may be a big adjustment as you think about how you come on each Sunday morning. 
Church is the authority of Jesus himself that he is given to affirm and to shape your Christian life as we gather under the truth of the Bible and the truth of Jesus. It's not the only thing, of course, there is to say about church. We'll come to that next week. But here, at least, there is authority from Jesus in the local church to affirm and to shape your Christian lives. Incidentally, that means, doesn't it, it's very much against the grain of Jesus' words to try and be part of more than one church. I've talked with some people about this already. It seems to me the question arises, which body of people are you accountable to? Which body of people are you responsible for? You and I basically still think of the church, I think, as a club. A tennis club, a bowls club, a book club. It's a voluntary organization. Membership is optional. We have a friendly group of people. We've got a common interest in Jesus of Nazareth. That's just what it is. Or we think church is a sort of service provider, pun intended. And all the say-so lies with the customer. We arrive for our particular slot in the day and we run ourselves through the service so that we feel better for the week ahead. And when it means we haven't managed to be around for two or three weeks, well, we shrug it off. That's just one of those things. Life is busy. And if the church is a club or if the church is a service provider, there is no reason for church to feature in any other part of life. That is, when I have, for example, a house move or a career change or a relationship issue, we make a decision without involving anything to do with the effect on others at church, my ability to get to church, my involvement with church. It certainly doesn't occur to us to talk with our small group, to consult with older believers about those decisions. No, no, we just announce our decision and we expect everyone to be pleased whatever we've decided. The assumption you see in all that thinking is that we have the right and authority to run our own lives. The church is just a club. Or maybe we're not that blunt. No, we're definitely not like Chris Gillibo. We know Jesus has the right over our lives. But do you see what Jesus is saying about how he exercises that right? He is saying, the authority on earth that I have set in place to shape your Christian life is the local church. Of course, that means godly teachers must teach the truth, but only as part of a whole local church together. And so we're not really helped, I don't think, to think about phrases like church membership, What does that conjure up but the club fees that I pay and the club benefits that I enjoy? Maybe from Jesus' words here, we're better off thinking about being subjects of the king. We are citizens of a kingdom who are recognized as the king's people. Jesus didn't leave us on our own to somehow affirm ourselves as people of his kingdom. No, he left the right kind of institution to say, these are my people. One church leader I read this week put it as we would never put it because it sounds far too risky. He said, if Jesus instituted the local church with authority over us, Christians don't join churches, they submit to them. Now for someone who isn't a Christian, maybe others too, that almost sounds dangerous in our day and age. The church is voluntary, of course I don't have to join. But from the point of view of the Christian life, It's not dangerous, it's what Jesus has wisely and lovingly set up. Because once you've chosen the Son, you've also chosen the Father and the whole family, the local church. Church membership is about a church taking spiritual responsibility for you and about you taking your share of responsibility for the church. Jesus starts the church with the revelation of God that he is the Christ. He then builds the church on that profession, which you see in Peter's life and generations on. And he gives the church authority 
to affirm and to shape Christian lives as the church sits under the truth about Jesus. And next week we're going to see a little more of how that happens in practice. Let me pray.